uh, one of the crucial questions that API architectures architects ask all the time, how do you avoid building a microservices Death Star? Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Great. I'll let you get into it. Now, just a quick reminder for people who are tuning in, please um, uh, share your questions. We'll have time at the end to be able to speak to all of our uh, presenters to be able to um, put your questions forward. Okay. So this looks great. I'll jump off. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, let us let us get going. So yes, this session is about how, how not to build a microservices that star, how not to build a that star, which may be counterintuitive considering how strong they are, but bear with me because I've thought it through. Um, all right. Um, so I uh, pretty often talk about the trade-off between uh, the agility, flexibility, and scale we get thanks to adopting microservices and, and architectures alike, and the complexity and the cost associated with it. I will not delve into this today. Uh, again, <laughs> some of you may remember me talking about this earlier. Um, suffice to say that there are good things coming from microservices, adopting microservices and things like this, but it obviously doesn't come free of cost and uh, we always need to uh, weigh the benefits versus the costs for, for doing something to see if it makes sense. So for, for the sake of this session, I'm going to simply um, uh, summarize it by saying that it's, it's easy to do monolith or monolithic applications, but it's not agile. It, we would not be fast enough with you know our, our innovations out of time to market. Um, so if we want to be more agile, we will get this flexibility with microservices architectures, but they are difficult to state the obvious, right? Um, let us look about you know how, how we're tackling this usually, and this is just to state the obvious. This will be nothing revolutionary for you, uh, but when we're starting with monolith, when we start decomposing this uh, for um, for for the right reason, we're, we're using one of the microservices' biggest values: the uh, ability of deployment, deployment of agility. Right? We're more agile, we're more flexible, we have more freedom when it comes to deciding how and, and what we deploy. And then we combine it with APIs. We combine it with API management uh, because we need to make these microservices talk to each other. Right? So this is a very simplistic view over how we go about decomposing the monolith. We break it down into smaller things and then we connect them using using APIs. I mean, it's simple as that, right? And we, we get all this flexibility, agility, and scale. So if, if one is so good, uh, why don't we do more? Because one was so good, so if we do more, it will be even better, right? And if more is good, why don't we do even more and, and, and more, right? <laughs> and and um, you know, soon enough, we'll realize that the architecture we've built um, resembles something that the Star Trek fans would recognize as the Death Star, right? Just from the looks of it. <laughs> but also, I mean, there will be other similarities. When, when we build such a massive infrastructure, such a massive architecture that um, is comprised of so many components that there will not be too many people understanding what is happening. There will probably be only like, you know, one sit lord knowing knowing what's going on, and it will take an army of stormtroopers to, to actually maintain and keep it running. So if you're wondering right now why it is so bad to have something as powerful as a as a as a Death Star, you know, if you if you remember um you know what it took in Star Wars to destroy the Death Star, it was only one fighter pilot, you know, aiming at a specific thing, and the entire thing collapsed, right? So <laughs> why the Death Star was powerful, it had a fundamental design flow, which made it collapse and, and disappear. This is not something we want from, you know, our architecture. So, so since 
since it was all good, you know, the, the, the marriage between microservices and APIs, that this was good, and we were repeating this and repeating over and over again, um, why it failed, you know, why, why it collapsed, what, what did we do wrong, what went wrong? Well, for starters, we violated some of the long-standing software principles. Uh, for example, uh, there was no design or even thinking of um, high cohesion and low coupling. This is this is nothing new. This is this has been there out, you know, for for ages. We we got trigger happy with building new microservices, and we built you know too many of them, not thinking about uh, about the structure, right? Uh, um, you know. High cohesion and low coupling have a reason for uh, for existing, and we want to be able to build code that you know the code that that is similar, uh, you know, works in one place, and then we bring layers. So it is essential to remember this, even if we build this model um, architectures. What also went wrong? Now um, there was no architectural structure to what we've been building. We were just dropping microservices in and, and trying to connect them with APIs. So there were no layers of, of encapsulation whatsoever, right? So we need to remember that, you know, microservices or not, we need structure to be able to, to manage the thing. Otherwise, it will just blow up on us. And, you know, poor software management, really. I mean, we were just chasing the reuse of the pattern, ignoring the reuse cost. I mean, it, it doesn't always make sense to decompose the model. Or even if it does, it doesn't make sense to decompose it to the very granular level, right? So this is what went wrong. We 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 were so trigger happy, you know. We we had a hammer in our hand, and the entire world seemed like a nail. And we forgot about the the, the fundamentals, the principles that that were guiding our architectural decisions. So let us not uh, do this again. Um, so. How do we fix it, right? Let's let's start over. Let's let's see what can help. So, the um, the low coupling and high cohesion thing, right? That if we want to think think on that side, what could help us in microservices architecture? Well, service mesh could, right? Service mesh implementations either you know if we build it or if we take something uh, ready out there, they are there to make developers' life easier to help them, you know, code the business logic only, as you can see in this example, you know, uh, with mesh, uh, all I need to do to have service A and service B talk to each other, you know, service A needs to be able to call service B and service B, I just need to code the business logic and, and the service mesh infrastructure will take care for everything else for me. It will discover the services, you know, their URLs where they are. Um, um, it will, you know, do the security for me and, and and whatnot, right? It will free me as a developer from working on on these topics. So, so good. So we can use service mesh not to build uh, microservices. That stuff. What we can also do, you know, to bring some structure to our architectures, we can again use one of the old uh, architectural um, frameworks, foundations, which is domain-driven design. Right. Let's bring let let us bring some structure. Let us group things together, things that make sense, and you know keep them closer for you know easier administering and and, uh, and managing of it. Uh, and it would be good to uh, also start thinking right away uh, about um, something that will connect our domains because they will not leave in in isolation, right? So once we the, the, this decide and design what our domains are, it would be good to have some kind of uh, ingress, egress controllers, such as API gateways to control the traffic uh, uh, between them. So, it, so that it happens in a controlled way, in a governed way. Uh, so we do the same thing again, right? We, uh, maybe we applied service mesh, maybe we, uh, we are at a data driven design, but, but that's it. We, we, we start our um, you know journey again. We we think that we fixed everything, but uh, what may still happen if we don't do something extra is that we can just build a bigger data, 
right? Um, right now, our building blocks will not be individual microservice, but maybe it will be domain. So uh, just by solving some of the aspects will not uh, make our architecture immune to, um, to some of the mistakes uh, from the past. So, uh, you know, is there a way, right? When working with microservices architectures, which are agile and, you know, volatile by nature, is there a way to actually bring some control? Well, well yes. Uh, we simply need some high level governing body that can provide the um, overview and control over, um, over the architecture. API management platforms can be such a governing, governing body. And now nobody likes the govern word, so you can call it control, right? Visibility and control, but we need some, high, some kind of uh, higher level entity that will control over, uh, have control over what we've built, visibility and control over what we've built and API management platforms um, can do that. However, most of the platforms these days, they will be missing something and, and this, uh, entire scenario calls out for for specific components to be available. So when we think about um, APIs and, and our use of APIs today, we mostly think about you know us having some APIs and then wanting to expose it um, in a controlled way, in a secure way, and so that we you know employ. Uh, an API gateway, or we simply use some API gateway pattern to, to, to do this, right? That's how we usually think. But when we um, embrace distributed architectures, when we talk about microservices, we realize that the microservices are talking to each other also using APIs. And this also, you know, if, if we want to build this properly, this needs um, a micro gateway a different flavor of a gateway that will be well suited for this microservices by private traffic or east-west traffic, as people call it, as opposed to the main gateways, the ingress, egress controllers that will be handling the north-south traffic. So we need, we need um, um, a, a worker, if you will, that the big API gateway will send out to the microservices world to make sure that the private traffic is, is controlled over there within the domains and across the domains. And if there's a need to expose something to the outside world, the API gateways, the egress, ingress controllers will be able to control it. So that's one thing that, that is required to realize, to have this high level governing body that will be looking at the things from, from um, the level up here into, into our microservice architecture. Uh, then, you know, we need to realize one thing about service meshes, the ones we built or the ones we use, that there's one fundamental flaw or, or gap in, in service mesh implementations. Remember why we wanted them, right? So that we wanted them so that our developers can, can focus on building the business logic and uh, so that the infrastructure gives them everything they need, but they don't need to worry about discoverability, observability, all these things. And you know, so far so good. But um, the thing is that most service meshes operate on, on a very low level of a stack, or level, layer four, which is essentially in the network layer. And if we need to do things like you know, masking sensitive data or understanding who the user is, or you know, make decisions about where to route traffic based on, on the messages themselves, or, or if you want to do some business level analytics, service mesh will fall short here. And again, developers will have to code this logging into their market service for this to happen. And that's not why we were embracing service mesh. We don't want them to code this. We want the mesh to uh, deliver this. Um, um, so um, what do we do next? Right, so if, if, if there's a gap. Well, at, at Software AG, we, we figured that if API management could be these platforms to uh, provide visibility and, and control over microservices applications, they need to have a couple of components that enable this. One of these components is a dedicated micro gateway, and another is, is a capability of working with service meshes. So there's something we call AppMesh at Software AG, and AppMesh is essentially uh, a capability that allows you to do the thing that you would have to code in Service Mesh to do the same thing in a configurable way um, using 
using API gateways, using configurations, policies that API people know, and, and achieve this application layer, this business layer enforcement, this visibility, control, and things like that, closing the gap of uh, service mesh implementations. So in the result, and at the end, we would have an architecture that would use um, API management components, API gateways, to make sure that, that things connect to each other, that microservices talk to each other, that domains are connected in a controlled way, that uh, if we need to expose something uh, to developers, we can do this again in a controlled and governed word way through developers portals. There's some governance about it and we have ways to engage people. So API management platforms as the governing body for uh, microservices not to build a dead star. Um, summarizing, uh, obviously microservices are good. Microservice architectures are good. They give us a lot of flexibility, a lot of agility, a lot of scale, but they do increase complexity. So there's we need to scale up to work with them and we need to uh, remember, uh, you know, the architectural principles that we work with. We cannot get trigger happy. Um, one of the things that can help us building uh, microservices architectures uh, is service mesh. Whether we build it or whether we take something from the market, uh, we can use them and they will help, but we need to realize that they have a big gap which sets us back, which, which would, if used only, you know, with the service mesh, which would uh, mean that our developers still need to code some business, some infrastructure logic, and we don't want that. API management and AppMesh specifically bridges the microservices world with the API management world for control and um, flexibility. So we can use API management and API management principles to decompose our models into, into microservices in a way that it will not result in in the microservices that star, which would sooner or later explode in our uh, faces. Um, if you don't know Software AG, we are a leader in the API management market. We've been ranked as a leader by Forrester and in, in the recent wave. So make sure to check it out if you're interested. If you want to learn more about us, you know, try us for free. Go to softwareag.cloud to, to try our, our API management. Visit us at GitHub. Uh, if you want to see how we do things about our API management and check more of our demos online. We have a YouTube channel where we can, you can see a lot of things uh, live over there. Um, that was it from me for now. I believe we have a few minutes for questions if, if there's any. Thank you, guys. The lag there. Thanks. Um, that was fantastic. A great introduction and overview of um, how to apply service meshes in order to be able to create that sort of microservices architecture. What, when you're working with, how well known is the idea of now service meshes? Is that something that's well understood? Mark, can you ask the question again, please? There was something on the line. Sure. So then, how well understood? So one of the um, areas that you're talking about is introducing the concept of service meshes. Yeah. Um, how well understood is service mesh uh, as a sort of technological approach or an architectural approach? How well understood is that? Uh, well, there, there's there's no one answer to this. Uh, it probably varies from industry to industry, but I can see service uh, meshes starting to be to be used. There's some realization among developers that, uh, yeah, they're, you know, well, it, it solves my problems here and there. It, it, it is missing some things that I still need. So uh, I, I don't see, you know, wide market adoption of service meshes yet, but people are definitely flirting with it because it is useful. Uh, but um, it, it needs some time to mature enough to, to be able to provide everything the developers you need, will need. Sure. Protik uh, Lahiri has asked, is this a new architecture pattern or is it a, just a way for API management? Um, well, microservices architecture, this is a new pattern, right? Um, and while we are, uh, what I was trying to say in this presentation, while we're adopting this, this, this new paradigm, 
we need to watch out for for some of the you know pitfalls that we haven't seen in the other architectures, right? We we don't we cannot forget about you know what we've been taught as as architects when we when we build a new thing. Microservices architecture, service mesh, it, it, it is a new thing, new way of building things. I mean, some may you know debate that 20 years back distributed architectures were still there. And, and that's probably true, but uh, thanks to the technology advancement, I mean, we're doing distributed architectures right now differently in a different scale than we, we were doing this at uh, 20 years ago. So, so yes and no, it's a new thing, but it's an old thing. Um, yeah. it, it's an old thing, but with new aspects to it. So we need to remember this when we, when we embrace it. We've got an interesting question. Um, uh, from Marwan from me, uh, Marwan Meadi, where uh, is asking. So, if you remember back, I think it's Martin Fowler says, you know, um, you need to be this tall to move to a microservices architecture. You know, to to be able to ride the ar microservices architecture uh, roller coaster. Because mm -hmm. until then, you don't really need that level of, um, you know, you don't need to be adopting that level of complexity. So, Marwan's mm -hmm. asked a similar question. When really should we adopt a service mesh? Is it a question of the number of microservices, microservices, or is it about the level of complexity that you have that you need to solve for? This is this is a very good question, and uh, uh, there's there's a there's a joke I like uh, about uh, related to this. When uh, when a boy is asking uh, his mother, "Hey, hey, mom, can you tell me, you know, what is a lightning?" And the mom responds, hey, uh, why don't you ask your father? He's an engineer. And the boy answers, yeah, I, I don't want to know that much. So, uh, so the, here's the thing with microservices that, that we, we, we want to adopt it because it, it, it seems so good, right? It, it has so many benefits, but, but there is a cost to it. And we, we need to skill up to understand um, how to do this properly, not to not to shoot ourselves in the foot. So, um, uh, th there's many aspects that we would need to consider answering the question. You know, when to go to microservices. First of all, the first question we need to uh, ask ourselves: What is wrong with the monolith? And this is not to defend the monolith. This is actually try to try to get an answer: What? Is wrong with our monolith. I mean, why we're we're trying to to um, decompose it, right? And and this will tell us whether microservices is a good direction. Um, um, if we want to be able to uh, run, you know, multiple product teams running multiple um, separate um, feature functions, so that they are, you know, they're independent from each other, work on their own schedule. Um, and uh, work using their own toolkits and uh, uh, their own their own preferred program, programming language. Microservices will give us this freedom, but then we will need to compare it with uh, with the cost of doing so. Okay, everybody will have their freedom in building their solutions, and will probably be quicker to market. But then uh, developers will be happy because they will get what they wanted, but the ops people, the operations people will not be happy because instead of dealing with one monolithic application, they will have to deal with like 10 or 20 of them and make sure they're connected and recover from failures and see failures, right? So we need to consider uh, such costs when, when making decisions. So um, it is not about having a number of macro services or, um, or microservices that would, uh, tell us when to adopt microservices. It is about doing an analysis of, of why the monolithic approach is wrong for us and trying to do something with this why. There's, yeah, fair enough. There was also something in, in your presentation around um, what problems are you trying to solve? So you talked about the need to have that business analytics insight and yeah. it may be that a service mesh isn't going to give you that sort of insight to the data. So there's so, some questions, you know, but that can be t tough for the architects to work with the, uh, the business people around really identifying what the um, problem use cases are, isn't, isn't there? Is that, that, that's a challenge, So, do you think? Or how do you go about, so sometimes 
the people that you would be wanting to speak to around what the problems are with the monolith, for example, they're not necessarily architecture people. They yeah. might be the people trying to extract value from the monolith. So how, how do you raise that or how do you involve them? Uh, it's a very good question, and it goes back to to uh, you know thing that is that is very old in IT. It is uh, about the language that our consumers are using and what we as the providers of the technology are telling them. So our our internal or external consumers would tell us things like, you know, the marketing department can can they can tell us, hey, I really need this up this application like next week because I need to run a campaign. And if we don't run this campaign, we're going to lose a lot of money. That's how business would communicate with us. And um, me being on the technology side, it's like next week, that's not doable. Do you know how much it takes me to roll out a new application? That, that, that is not doable. So, and here's the problem. I need to start thinking why it is not doable. I mean, my business has a need. Why am I not able to, to, to deliver on what they need? Is it, is it my architecture that is wrong? If I actually change the architecture of the things, would I be able in the future to say next week? No problem. Right? So if, if that's the problem I identified, this is what I tackle, and this is how I design my solution decomposing the monolith so that the next time the, the, the marketing guy comes to me and says, sure, next week we'll do it. Wow, wow, fantastic. Okay, that was a fantastic uh, presentation and a great start for our uh, talks on API architecture patterns for this afternoon. Uh, I'll ask you to leave the stage now. So um, 